Thank you, Joan. Um, I'm Andre Haig from the Faculty of Japanese Literature in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures. And I'm truly delighted to introduce today's speaker, uh, who we are proud to call one of our own in the EL and are expecting uh, great things from, and have already seen great things from. Um, it's Francesca Pizarro. Uh, Francesca is a doctoral candidate in Japanese literature in our Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures. And she is uh, currently also a Center for Japanese Studies graduate fellow. Uh, Francesca received her BA in East Asian Studies at the City University of New York, Queens College, and then her MA in Japanese Literature right here at UH Manoa. Uh, following a recent year of uh, doctoral research at the University of Tsukuba in Ibaraki, Japan, with the generous support of the Crown Prince Akihito Foundation Scholarship, uh, she has now returned to the heartland of the U.S. mainland, uh, Kansas City, uh, Missouri, or, sorry, Missouri, I believe, uh, where she is uh, currently completing her dissertation. Um, Francesca's research, uh, which we're all very excited about, focuses on representations of the jogakse, or schoolgirl figure in Japanese literature and culture from the Meiji period on. Uh, the dissertation project with the working title, The Schoolgirl, in city, home, and school, envisioning gender and space in early 20th century uh, fiction and culture is the basis for her talk today. Um, her talk is titled, Schoolgirl Spotting in Early 20th Century Japanese Fiction, Rereading Mushino Koji Saneatsu's Omere Takihito. Um, so please, uh, please enjoy that. And after the talk, I will moderate the Q&A. You can type out your questions. Um, during the talk, you may also post comments or, uh, or questions, uh, and I will try to monitor that. And I think uh, Francesca will also keep an eye on that, uh, especially if you have a point related to one of the images she's showing or you want to clarify anything, um, you can post that right away. So with no further ado, um, I'd like to welcome our, our speaker. And I, I'm sure you're all applauding her uh, and, and with big smiles. You just can't see it or hear it. So thank you, Francesca. You have the floor. Um, can I, can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I'd like to begin uh, by expressing my thanks. There's a lot of people and uh, I'd like to thank, um, especially beginning with the Center for Japanese Studies for reaching out to me um, and inviting me to give this talk. And thank you to my department, the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I'd like to give special uh, thanks to Gay and Joan for working to organize this webinar series. And finally, a warm uh, uh, thank you to uh, Professor Haig for uh, taking the time to uh, moderate this talk. Of course, I'd also like to thank um, everyone who's uh, coming to virtually to this presentation today. Uh, a very warm hello, uh, I'm deeply appreciated, appreciative of you making the time this afternoon and for showing interest in this presentation. Um, as Professor Haig mentioned, this uh, talk is uh, based uh, largely on sections of my dissertation, which I'm currently in the process of writing. Uh, very briefly, the larger dissertation project examines the representations of the jogakse or schoolgirl in the fiction and popular culture of the first decades of the 20th century, directing particular attention to the spaces of the city, home, and school. These are the popular settings for her portrayal in both image and text. From the formative years of the Meiji era, uh, the years 1868 to 1912, the Jogakse cut a striking figure in Japan's modern landscape. She was a novel sight as she made her way to the school on the streets of Tokyo. And just as quickly, her image was reproduced and reimagined in a variety of print media, including newspaper reports, advertisements, education manuals, satirical cartoons, and girls' magazines. In my dissertation, I examined various works of fiction featuring the schoolgirl alongside this vibrant print culture, 
considering how social and literary discourses of the period engage with each other in fraught encounters to define schoolgirls and to gender and engender spaces. In this presentation, I have two aims. First, I want to provide an introduction to one of the most popular iterations of the schoolgirl image in the first decades of the 20th century. This, uh, that is the spectacle of the schoolgirl making her way into the city of Tokyo on her school commute. In one of the most influential incarnations of this image, the schoolgirl Hagiwara Hatsuno in Kosugi Tengai's blockbuster newspaper novel, Makaze Koikaze, translated as Winds of the Devil, Winds of Love, hurdles into the narrative, sporting maroon hakama trousers, feather pattern kimono, and large Western hair ribbon, the iconic schoolgirl attire. Pedaling at breakneck speed on her Dayton bicycle, her long hair flying behind her, she captures the gaze of a crowd of onlookers and newspaper readers as she aims for the gates of the Imperial All Girls Academy. The indelible mark left by this opening scene and the dynamic illustration that we see accompanying it is demonstrated in the variety of ways the image is reimagined and reproduced, almost from its publication. The schoolgirl on a bicycle became a feature of advertisements, for example. Here we see a flyer uh, advertisement sample. So uh, people would select this particular uh, template and they would put in their advertisement uh, regarding, let's say, a sale in a store and uh, post that here. So this was a common uh, flyer uh, in 1903. Also, everyday people wrote in, account wrote in accounts of schoolgirl sightings to newspapers. Here we see uh, a uh, reader of Yomiuri Shun submitting a uh, letter to the editor remarking on some schoolgirl sightings. And he specifically, oh, her, he or she specifically um, cites the influence of Makaze Koikaze. As I will illuminate in greater detail moving forward, the Jogakse making her way to and from school was such an iconic part of the city's landscape. Notably, she was closely linked to new technologies of commute and travel. This was true not only for the bicycle, as we've seen, but also the commuter train and streetcar systems that revolutionized modern Tokyo in the same period. As the title of my talk indicates, I will also examine Musha Koji Saniatsu's 1911 debut novel, Omede Takihito, translated as A Blessed Person. In Omede Takehito, the, narr the male narrator, known only to readers by the first, pronoun, first person pronoun Jibun, introduces himself as a man starved for a woman. He narrates his days spent attempting to meet the object of his one-sided infatuation, a schoolgirl named Suru. Though he has never exchanged a word with her in conversation or writing, he is determined to make her his bride and attempts on multiple occasions to press his marriage suit to her parents through a matchmaker. Turned down each and every time, he remains naively optimistic that against all odds, she surely returned his feelings. Spurred on by nothing but an, but an unfounded sense of destiny and a self-affirming vision of the world around him, he sets out every day to catch sight of the schoolgirl on the rails and roads of Tokyo. Despite the centrality of the schoolgirl figure in this novel, the past century of critical and scholarly reception has failed to adequately examine the narrator's experience of and movement through the urban landscape in search of the schoolgirl. Omede Takihito's enduring reputation as an eye novel has rendered invisible its connection to other literature and popular media of the period that made the presence of schoolgirls in Tokyo's landscape a staple of cultural life. My goal is to situate the text within the contemporaneous discourses on the schoolgirl and consider how the schoolgirl and her commute plays a defining role in structuring the novel and in bringing about Jibun's narrative triumph over reality. So I'm gonna start with talking a little bit more about the schoolgirl in the city and some background information. Uh, throughout my examination of Jogakse in fiction and popular culture, I refer specifically to the category of young women that emerged from the modern institutions of female education established in the late Meiji era. The higher girls schools, koto jogakko, or simply jogakko, 
and early women's colleges. Such institutions increased in number and were standardized under the 1899 Girls' Higher School Order, or the Koto Jogakkore. They were responsible not only for constructing a modern female identity, but an identity also defined by national agendas and an emergent discourse in urban middle-class life. Although they made up a small segment of the population, their iconography demonstrates that they had profound impact on the popular imagination, both as subjects of narratives and the producers of culture in their own right. The establishment of modern institutions of education for women was widely debated throughout the Meiji era, with modernizers promoting higher education for women as an essential step in the national project. Christian educated progressives not only promoted Western trends and social attitudes for adoption by Japanese society, but made the education of women the crucial component for putting Japan on better footing with its Western counterparts. However, the earliest schools for women founded by only a few Christian missionaries only served the daughters of the upper echelons of Japanese society. It was not until the late Meiji period that the state policy began to address higher education for a larger population of women. Honda Masako's landmark work on schoolgirl culture of the Meiji period, Jogakusei no Keifu, or the genealogy of the schoolgirl, attributes the birth of the concept of Jogakusei to the promulgation of the girls' higher school order of 1899, which brought about the increased establishment of these institutions and their regulation under the direct authority of the Meiji state. The girls' higher school order was the first imperial degree that specially addressed the policies and purposes behind providing young women with higher levels of education beyond the compulsory six years of primary school. It decreed that a minimum of one girls' higher school be established in each prefecture and also encouraged the establishment of such schools on regional and municipal levels. With the enactment of the girls' higher school order, the number of girls' higher schools and schoolgirls increased tremendously jumping from a mere 70 schools and 17,000 uh, students in 1901 to 608 sco 618 schools and 275,000 students in 1925 nationwide. A major consequence of this marked increase in the number of girls' schools and schoolgirls was their increased visibility in the modern landscape, which just as quickly resulted in making them staples in the fiction and popular culture of the period. Until the establishment and institutionalization of girls' higher education required daughters of middle to upper class families to step out of the home and travel to schools, they were not often seen in public. They began to have a visible and highly recognizable presence in the public sphere as schoolgirls. In particular, they became closely associated with the landscape of Tokyo, which contained the highest concentration of girls' schools. Girls traveled to Tokyo from the countryside and became fixtures in public life they were rendered even more recognizable because of that distinct look. So that's ha having the uh, Western style bow, the feather pattern kimono and pleated maroon hakama pants. As Elisa Friedman discusses in her monograph, Tokyo in Transit, they became a force in Tokyo's mass transit systems. Following the Russo-Japanese war, there was a massive extension of existing rail lines in Tokyo. These infrastructure changes brought about the growth of Tokyo's suburbs where elites, including schoolgirls, could make the commutes to the city center. In Tayama Katai's 1907 novel, Ton, The Quilt, another literary work featuring a schoolgirl character, the male protagonist's observations succinctly captures the iconic signs of Japan's rapid transformations, trains and schoolgirls. Society was advancing with each new day Suburban trains had revolutionized Tokyo's transport system. Girl students, jogakusei, had become something of a force and nowadays, even if he'd wanted to, he wouldn't have been able to find the old fashioned sort of girl he'd known in his courting days. As Friedman foregrounds, the novel presence of the schoolgirls on the city's mass transit system offered an unprecedented opportunity for the practice of girl watching. According to Friedman, the increasingly common sight of the elite young women on trains changed the way they were seen in the popular imagination. It is important to highlight Omedetaki Hito's connection to the wealth of images and texts in the first decades of 20th century that made the presence of schoolgirls on trains 
and in the public sphere in general, a staple of cultural consumption in the period. So we can play a little bit uh, of spotting the schoolgirl in the next two slides. Uh, in this first slide, once again, we see how both the images of the train and the schoolgirl um, appear uh, side by side as part of the landscape in Tokyo. And we see our schoolgirl here. And we also have a possible schoolgirl here in Western clothing on her bicycle. And the next slide is a little bit tougher. It's a night view, but uh, this is a schoolgirl right here. So her um, distinctive attire is really a huge marker when looking at images of schoolgirls in this period. Okay. So I'm going to move on to a bit more of a close reading of uh, our novel, Omega Takito, highlighting along the way the text's contributions to the discourse on the schoolgirl in the city. So uh, please beware, spoilers abound in our close reading here. So Omeda Takihito opens on the morning of January 29th. Our narrator protagonist, Jibun, has just finished shopping at the Maruzen bookstore. Stepping out onto the street, he turns right and comes up to a four-way intersection. Considering whether to turn right at the corner or continue going straight, he glances into the street on his right. Upon seeing two women standing on the street, we are told that his feet turn right. Based on their kimono and heavy white makeup, he assumes the women must be geisha. And though not necessarily beautiful, they aren't ugly either. There is a, there is a charming quality to their faces. As he walks past him, uh, he nonchalantly steals a glance. And at that moment, somewhere inside him, his heart announces, I am starved for a woman. The term in Japanese is jibun wa onna ni ueteru. Truly, I am starved for a woman. I'm afraid to say it but I'm starved for a beautiful young woman ever since seven years ago when I was 19 years old and Tsukiko, who I loved returned to her hometown. I, who have never even spoken to any beautiful young woman have been starved for a woman. Now walking at a brisk pace, he comes up to a streetcar line. He doesn't wait to board one, but chooses to cut through the nearby Hibiya park to return home. There the sight of the young of young couples uh, chatting happily elicits feelings of jealousy and resentment. He feels keenly his intense state of loneliness and once again announces, I am starved for a woman. He hurries home thinking about the current object of his one-sided love. And this is the schoolgirl Tsuru. As illustrated in his opening passage, Jibun's experience of and movement through the urban landscape particularly in pursuit of the women who populate it, is a striking feature of his narration and self-revelation. In quick succession, the chance sighting of women on the road prompts him to turn a street corner and, close, and a closer look at their faces elicits the hyperbolic outbursts of anguish desire. I am starved for woman. The phrase appearing practically verbatim five times in Jibun's opening passage and repeated many more times throughout the narrative signals the conscious performance by and representation of its narrator as a desiring male subject. As we will see moving forward, Jibun's routine practice of leaving his house to meet Tsuru becomes, through his narrative process, the means by which he can repeatedly portray his anguished desire. But also, uh, the practice becomes the means through which he constructs for himself a self-affirming view of a less than ideal reality. Following the opening scene I've just summarized, we quickly learn that Jibun, the 25-year-old second son of a well-to-do family living in Tokyo, has been in love with Tsuru, a girl in her late teens, after repeatedly seeing her in his neighborhood on the way to school. His proposals of marriage have already been rejected on multiple occasions, but he remains undeterred, even after his chances of meeting her, her dwindles once her household relocates to the Okubo suburbs west of Tokyo. As our narrator's story begins, almost a year has passed since he has seen Tsuru, last spotting her on the Kobu. This is now the JR Chuo train line, uh, if you're familiar with the Tokyo area. Uh, and so he last spotting her on the Kobu train line on April 4th of the previous year. This has not deterred him and, 
His narrative describes his hopes for hopes of and repeated attempts to set out and meet her. This practice of encountering the schoolgirl, as I will be illuminating in the next in the rest of this presentation, appears in reality to be nothing more than stalking the vicinity of her school gate, as well as keeping a lookout for her on train rides and whenever he finds himself in the Okobo area. As he revisits the routine sites of previous encounters, Jibun summons memories of previous sightings and conjures fantasies of Tsuru as his wife, projecting visions of both recollected past and imagined future onto the Tsuru-less streets of the present. After finally spotting her once again on the Kobu train line for the first time in over a year, he becomes assured of the certainty of her love for him. Believing his marriage with her to be eminent, he is devastated to learn a few months later that Tsuru has become the wife of another man. At the novel's close, however, he continues to cling to the belief that Tsuru nevertheless did in fact love him. Jibun's concluding lines drive home the triumph of a self-affirming narrative when he declares that even if she were to tell me I have never once thought of you, I would no doubt take them as mere words and think them nothing more than Tsuru's consciousness. It is the novel's representation of extreme subjectivity and its singular protagonist's dogged pursuit of self-affirmation that drew the attention of the literary establishment then and shaped the reputation of the novel since. Omere Takehito is remembered as one of the origins of the I novel, or Shisho Setsu. Although the debates around the concept of the Shisho Setsu first came into prominence in the mid-20s and mid-30s, critics and writers of that period retroactively designated such works as Katai's Futon and Musha Koji's Omere Takehito as one of the first I novels. This critical discourse equated serious writing with works that expressed an author's unmediated presence in the text. In other words, it presumed the narrator and protagonist of the work to be the author. This powerful and enduring mode of reading, to borrow Tomi Suzuki's phrase, has all but sealed the work's critical reception in Japanese literary history. Writing in 1968, noted literary critic uh, Honda Shugo waxes lyrical of the novel's unabashed self-revelation. Omere Takihito, written in a style so simple even a primary school student would understand, is first and foremost original. The writer's manner of breaking out from the onset with the point blank expression, I am starved for a woman, is, a mo is most original. He portrays an ardent love towards a girl who is right up to the novel's end, who right up to the novel's end he has never once spoken to. And yet it is a splendid novel of disappointed love. The igniting of his core is a sight to behold. The Shishosetsu mode of reading, of which this is an example, closes the novel to interpretations that consider the functions of the schoolgirl of the schoolgirl figure as depicted through Jibun's highly subjective narrative. Throughout his narrative, Jibun proves himself to be steeped in the various discourses on the schoolgirl. Not only does he prove himself through, throughout the text to be an avid consumer of and heavily reliant on the visual presence of the schoolgirl in public, his desire for her has less to do with some striking physical quality or personality trait he has grown to appreciate about her. He essentially doesn't know anything else about her and has more to do with the social expectations attached to the schoolgirl figure. As the socially recognized ideal partner to the elite Meiji era man, becoming husband and wife with a schoolgirl first allows the fastidious and sexually inexperienced Jibun, who seeks to resolve the dilemma of his base lust without sacrificing his loftier ideals, the appropriate partner to satisfy and consequently reconcile his intense inappropriate desire. The degree to which the schoolgirl was seen as an ideal prospect for marriage in this society is depicted in Jibun's obsessive desire to scan for Tsuru's name in the newspapers among the yearly list of students graduating with honors. While newspaper accounts of the schoolgirl could often be fixated on her negative incarnation, popularly called the, the Daraku Jogakse, or a corrupt schoolgirl, they also offered a celebratory image of her through the practice of publishing honor students' names in graduation ceremony announcements. So we have an a real life example of such an uh, announcement in the Asahi Shimbun. 
as Jibun's example shows, such a practice allows for a different kind of opportunity to put the schoolgirl in public display, especially in order to capture the attention of male suitors searching for prospects among the girls' school graduates. When Jibun first saw the graduation announcement in the Asahi newspaper two years ago, he saw that Suru's name was not among the list of honor students at her school, and he assumes with relief that she's not as, br not as bright a student and therefore not a particularly good candidate for marriage. It turns out, however, that Tsuru has not yet graduated. The activity of looking out for Tsuru's name sub subsequently becomes a yearly practice that Jibun awaits with the same excitement as the prospect of meeting her in the flesh. As we have seen, Jibun's hopes of making Tsuru his ideal wife remains a distant prospect for as long as her family continues to refuse his proposals of marriage and keep him at arm's length. The possibility of encountering Tsuru in the public space of the city or in the textual space of the newspaper remains the only avenue by which she can even quite literary, literally dream, uh, dream about being with his schoolgirl love. Once again, Tsuru's position as a schoolgirl is important to recognize since it is her school commute, its predictability and timing and determined route that jumpstarts the self-affirming and self-sustaining acts of his imagination. Despite the familiarity with which he speaks about Tsuru in his narrative, it is strikingly clear to us that Jibun's image of Tsuru is actually determined by his position as a virtual stranger to his object of desire. His inability to reach any degree of closeness to her is no different from the perspective of the public masses who chance, to spot, uh, who chance upon her on the roads and rails. His vision of her is in fact a public gaze, no different from the images we have seen of the schoolgirl. In this particular image, we can find the schoolgirl right here. I hope my mouse is showing. Uh, in this novel, Jibun's attempts to possess Tsuru through marriage are not successful. And, it's and it is because of this that, that the desire to possess his schoolgirl love is realized through the act of tracing her movements through the city and through the act of narrating that experience. In a study on repetition in the narrative practices of key eye novel texts, Hoyt Long and Anthony Detweiler and Yuan Cheng Ju considers the, remark the remarkably excessive repetition and redundancy of words and phrases in Omeretaki Hito to be indicative of its narrator's monomaniacal and narcissistic compulsion or uh, for self-affirmation. While their project focuses on the lexical repetition in the narrative, I argue that the, that the compulsion to repeat in order to realize his ideal self is satisfied not only through his deliberate and unsettling use of language, but also his repeated attempts to encounter Tsuru, which consumes the majority of his narrative. I return to this passage uh, we've previously encountered to highlight how the act of meeting Tsuru takes on intense significance in the narrative. The word Jibun uses throughout his uh, text is ao, uh, meaning to meet in a manner of a much more meaningful encounter with someone. So suggesting something of a conversation or an interaction. However, all past experiences of and continuing attempts to meet her actually describes the act of merely catching sight of Tsuru and at best reflecting uh, at, and at best briefly locking eyes with her. The use of meeting instead of the probably more appropriate term seeing suggests an optimism and certainty of encounter that contrasts with the realities of his true relationship with Sudo. These encounters are endowed with the importance of a meaningful interaction, precisely because they are in fact rare events, relying on chance and his limited understanding of the patterns of her movement. As a man outside the proper realms of household and school, the only chance of encountering her in public is severely circumscribed. So just looking closely at the topography uh, of the story, three distinct locations feature prominently in Suru's school commute and thus in Jibun's movement through the city, as well as his presence, uh, as well as his process of narration. So to orient ourselves here, we have Tokyo here. Uh, this is the city center. Uh, we have Shinjuku, which is technically not part of the city center quite yet in this period. And then we have uh, the Western 
suburbs of Tokyo, which actually make up uh, Tokyo today. So the first uh, site is the vicinity of the Okubo train station located in the suburbs west of Tokyo, now part of the present day Shinjuku ward, but at the time a growing suburban neighborhood for the urban elite. Uh, if you're familiar with Tokyo now, the Okubo area is actually uh, the location for Tokyo's uh, Koreatown now. So quite a bustling place compared to how it looked like in this period. Um, and then we also have uh, the Yotsuya, the vicinity of the Yotsuya station. And this is uh, presumably where Tsuru School is located and where Jibun lives. And then the third uh, location is basically the Kobu or Chuo train line itself that connects the two locations. In the following passage, Jibun visits a friend who lives in the Okubo neighborhood and immediately connects his presence there to an opportunity to meet Tsuru. Taking note of the poor road conditions in the neighborhood, Jibun recalls a time he chanced upon Tsuru in the vicinity of her school. Running up to a group of friends, she had broken one of the teeth of her high wooden clogs, so the takageta. If only for a brief instance, it had seemed as though Tsuru had locked eyes with Jibun. The memory comes rushing back to him at the sight of the poor roads, and he imagines a time when he would walk the Okobo streets of the present with Tsuru as his wife and tease her about that time he, a bystander, had seen her break her clogs. In this scenario, a public event witnessed as a bystander becomes to Jibun a treasured memory of shared experience between himself and Tsuru. In this instance, as in all events that occur in Jibun's narrative until the climactic train meeting, the real Tsuru is notably absent from the text and it is Jibun's memories of past encounters with her as well as his daydreams of a future in which they are together that are projected onto the Tsuru-less streets of Okubo. In another extended passage seen here, Jibun stalks the vicinity of her school in order to meet her on her birthday. Having learned the date of Tsuru's birthday, Jibun sets out on the day and comes to, up to the road with the best opportunity for meeting her as she leaves for, for the school. This is the same vicinity and perhaps even the same road that Jibun describes previously when he recalls the incident of her clogs breaking. Hopefully, Hopeful that he would surely see her today, after almost a year of not meeting her, he scans the group of girls walking past him, but this time, Tsuru was not among the group of girls. Pushing the limits of his bravery, Jibun decides to even walk past the school gates and glance into the school. Disheartened by his failure to catch sight of her, Jibun resolves that if Tsuru were to ever become his wife, he would scold her for failing to uh, have appeared on that day. In this particular instance, Jibun's schoolgirl stalking is described as a routine made possible by repeated practice and the long time of service grasp of pattern behavior. He is aware of the roads that offer the highest probability of meeting her and even the number of schoolgirls in the groups they move in. A notable aspect of his practice is the typical avoidance of the school structure itself. His fear of even walking past its open gates from which the schoolgirls enter and exit emphasizes the impermeable nature of the all-girls school. In this case, the physical place of the all-girls school serves not only as a destination for the schoolgirl, but also a space through which the schoolgirl watcher's gaze cannot penetrate. Here again, Jibun uses the experience of past encounters to navigate his movement through space. Prompted by Tsuru's absence from the scene in the present, he imagines a hypothetical future in which he is married to Tsuru and in an intimate and authoritative position as her husband to scold her by failing to meet him. As these examples demonstrate, the notion of meeting Tsuru begins to take on an added nuance. It involves an active mobilization of memory and fantasy, the self he wishes to realize through Tsuru within the setting of the city and specifically on the route of her commute. It is important to note that in all his fantasies of Tsuru as his wife, they remain set in the city, in the public space of the city. 
he appears unable to imagine how their future would play out within the domestic space of the home. Throughout a narrative shaped by Tsuru's protracted absence from the cityscape, Jibun's chance encounter with her on the Kobu train line has all the elements of a climactic moment in the narrative. We have seen to some degree how the image of schoolgirls on trains captured the popular imaginary. The degree to which a schoolgirl uh, captured the gaze of bystanders is also represented in Omereta Kihito, as when Jibun's friend remarks that beautiful women who commute to school by train become the topic of rumor and talk. Following this remark, Jibun acknowledges that Tsuru's beauty is such that he can't escape the eyes, that she can't escape the eyes of men starved for women and was undoubtedly already the talk of a few people. Contrary to his attempt to set himself apart from the kinds of looking employed by those strangers on the train, it is exactly this kind of mechanism of vision that Jibun deploys when he finally meets her on the Kobu train line. The encounter is interesting for the depiction of the realities of riding the train, especially the opportunities award afforded passengers for watching the schoolgirl and even making physical contact with her. As previously discussed, the train car was a place where people of diverse social and class backgrounds could share space. As Friedman reminds us, train travel changed the nature of seeing and transformed the way pe people viewed the landscape and significantly each other. In the confined space of the passenger car, strangers were forced either to look at the people sitting or standing in close proximity or to find a means of avoiding contact. In this way, the public open access space of the train car can be contrasted with the school space, which is closed off to the public gaze and has a limited permeability. Besides the roads frequented by schoolgirls, the train car provides the opportunity for an outsider like Jibun to come into close proximity with a schoolgirl. So we can draw notable similarities, for example, between Jibun's self-realization through the schoolgirl, Tsuru, and to the protagonist's circumstances narrated in Tayama Katai's short story, Shoujo Byo, translated as Girl Fetish or Girl Sickness. Published four years prior in the May 1907 issue of the journal Tayo in, <clears throat> in Shoujo Byo, a salaryman writes a salaryman and writer of girls' fiction is derided as a laughingstock for his schoolgirl obsession. His only consolation is that his commute to and from work coincides with that of schoolgirls, which allows him to fantasize about starting a relationship with one of them. He becomes so wrapped up in his daydreams that at the end of the story, he is killed by an oncoming train, highlighting the potential negative consequences of school schoolgirl watching. The way that train travel encourages the man's fantasies and facilitates his gaze is illustrated in the following scene in Shoujo Bill. The narrator describes the passing landscape seen from the windows of the commuter train as it leaves the Yoyogi station. So this is, uh, he's also on the tr same train line that is featured in Omereta Kihito. So this is the Kobu and now Chuo train line. Uh, the beauty of Mount Fuji is seemingly of no consequences to the man's attentions, which is preoccupied with looking at two female students opposite him. Uh, quote, gazing upon living beings, however, is more troublesome than gazing upon mute nature. And so, sensing he might dis be discovered if he stared too openly, he was pretending to look to the side while flashing furtive sidelong glances of the girls. As someone once said, when it comes to girl watching on trains, it's too direct to watch them face on, whereas from a distance, it's too conspicuous to arouse people's suspicions. Therefore, the most convenient seat to occupy is one di diagonally opposite, at rather an oblique angle. Being an obsessive girl watcher, Sugita had not of course had, not of course had to be taught this secret and had naturally discovered the technique for himself, never wasting any suitable opportunity. The interior of the Kobu train car in particular was set up in such a way as to facilitate opportunities for looking as well as the discomfort of being looked at. The car consisted of two benches with backs against the, win with backs against the car windows and facing each other. The distance between the benches are much narrower than present day JR train lines, making the act of looking especially more pronounced. 
further reinforcing the fact that such acts were clearly a defining feature of his commute to and from work. It also shows that such, a clandestine, that such clandestine glances at the female body is made possible precisely because of the crowded conditions of Tokyo's trains, quite distinct from the depictions and experiences of train travel in other parts of the country. In the girl watching scene in, in Omerita Kihito, Jibun finally spots Suru while riding the Kobu train line, since last seeing her a year ago on the same train line. Returning home from visiting his friend in the Nakano suburbs, so further west of uh, Tokyo, he takes the Kobu line into the city. As becomes his habit, riding this train inevitably raises the possibility of riding the same train as Tsuru, and his excitement mounts at the possibility. This time, however, his, superstitions, his, his superstitious trust in destiny rewards him with the reality of seeing Tsuru. The journey occur, occurring between Okubo Station, uh, where Tsuru boards the train, and Yotsuya Station, where both characters exit, here we go, illuminates the nature of seeing afforded by train travel and underscores how the position of the schoolgirl in the city allows the short-lived fantasy of Jibun's marriage with Tsuru. The account of this May 12th encounter with Tsuru is described in great detail. In the extended narrative, time slows down as, as Jibun as the narrator describes every aspect of Jibun as the protagonist's encounter. As Long, Detweiler, and Ju observes of this climactic scene, repetition not only suggests inner turmoil, but also serves to slow down the action, linking each step to the next while preserving a sense of singular focus. The effect of a slowed down action that stretches the events of a single train ride with, uh, across multiple pages further accentuates the value of this meeting for Jibun. Here, even when faced with the objective reality of Tsuru, she appears as a text Jibun willfully and selfishly reads for his own purposes. Let's look at the um, encounter. After leaving Nakano Station, the train stops at Kashiwagi Station before departing again. Jibun's excitement mounts as the train pulls into Okubo and he scans the platform. He spots Tsuru and it seems as though she had noticed him. She was about to enter through the back when her feet stop abruptly. She turns back and boards through the front. Jibun notes how their eyes met and how she blushed slightly. Though a seat was vacant across from him, she sits on the same bench as Jibun with three people between them, giving him a less than ideal view of her. But Jibun is nevertheless pleased at the thought that she had sat where she did so she could avoid facing him in her fluster. Jibun notes each train stop, first at Shinjuku, then Yoyogi, Sendagaya, Shinanomachi, and finally at Yotsuya, where he and Tsuru disembark. Jibun follows directly behind Tsuru as they reach the ticket gate, at which point Tsuru moves to the side, seeming to indicate that Jibun walked through the ticket gate before her. In this most substantial encounter with Tsuru yet, Jibun is able to reaffirm in that briefest and most casual interaction, their future together as husband and wife. Following this meeting, he becomes assured of her love for him and considers their marriage as a matter of course. In his final and most substantial meeting with Tsuru, he is driven to complete happiness by the reenactment in the present and in the public spaces of the city, the married life he envisions for himself in Tsuru. In Jibun's self-affirming vision of the rather banal encounter with her, she appears as a sweet and blushing wife well-versed in the role of Ryosai, or good wife. When she reaches the ticket gate, she seems to pay attention to Jibun's presence behind her and wordlessly indicates that he exit ahead of her. This gesture between, a very, dis between very distant acquaintances is interpreted by Jibun in his delusion as the enactment of a husband and wife relationship, one that allows him to walk ahead through the ticket barrier with the authority of the husband in the public spaces of the city. Despite the expectations mobilized by Jibun's narrative about finally meeting the key figure in, real, in the realization of his self-development, 
The climactic encounter with Tsuru on the train does not lead to any permanent or meaningful solution to Jibun's state of longing. In fact, despite the reality of Tsuru's presence in the scene, she remains a mere screen by which Jibun can continue to do the work of projecting his distinct and self-affirming fantasy. While scholar Katayama Haruo points out that meeting Tsuru on the train was a critical moment, providing the greatest danger to his constructed sense of omedetasa, or blessedness, I argue that Jibun in fact rallies his narrative abilities to mediate reality quite well. His determined belief in his destiny with her not only appears to survive the encounter intact, but rings even truer as he anticipates their impending marriage. What amounts to a banal encounter with Tsuru in which the degree of her awareness of his presence remains unclear becomes for Jibun not only proof of her love for him, but ultimately a reenactment of their destiny as husband and wife. Even the seemingly decisive blow to Jibun's constructed belief and destiny, the news of Tsuru's marriage to another man proves to be a merely momentary setback in the victory of his self over reality. For he continues to believe that Tsuru must have loved him despite having to bow to her parents' wishes. Even the resounding and unbelievable and undeniable reality of her marriage, which closes him off completely from the possibility of overcoming his position as a stranger to her, does not result in a tragic narrative of heartbreak. Indeed, Jibun's narrative, which begins during the most extended period of Tsuru's absence from his field of vision, demonstrates that the ability to construct his ideal image of her can be exercised without her presence and needs only his ability to stalk her commute, remembering and envisioning her in the city. So uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk, uh, but uh, I just like to highlight uh, what I hope to achieve in this uh, particular presentation, which was really bringing to the fore uh, something that a lot of critics um, have yet to really focus on in Omeritati Hito, and that is uh, how you know popular discourses, contemporaneous popular discourses, really aren't uh, considered in relation uh, to the text. And uh, Jibun's uh, process of self-narration um, is really something that can only happen when he walks through the city and when he does so particularly through um, schoolgirl spotting, which as we see here, a common is actually a common uh, activity. Um, or feature of daily everyday life in Japan during the Meiji period. So uh, I'm really welcoming questions and uh, a lot of feedback from all of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you, Francesca.